Hello, mic check. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's time to get started. Uh, thank you all for being here today at our panel on business innovations for digital inclusion and on bridging gaps. Today, you will hear from excellent experts across, from across the world on how they are innovating in the digital space and increasing internet adoption and inclusion by creating relevant content and expanding opportunities for internet users. This workshop will focus on how both the private and multilateral sectors are helping close the digital gap and supporting meaningful connectivity. We will first start by going around to our panelists and hearing about what they do and how they are supporting digital inclusion. Do you want to start, Mark? Good morning to all. I'm Mark Dersgeld. I run a small consultancy called Governance Primer. And what we do, we try to engage the Global South in policy making discussions in technology forums. And that has been a process that has been ongoing for a few years. We are starting to get more of a voice within ICANN and other bodies. And I feel like this is a good step for us. Thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sasha Rubel, and I'm Program Specialist at UNESCO. Uh, for many of you, you will associate UNESCO with our work on cultural heritage, but in fact, we work across uh, five sectors. Uh, the education sector, culture sector, the natural sciences and social and human sciences, and what we call communication and information, which looks specifically at digital literacy and media and information literacy. So in the framework of our work at UNESCO, and I'm sure I'll be able to talk a little bit more about it uh, during the panel, uh, we centralize uh, the question of digital inclusion through both research, policy guidance, and capacity building with a specific focus on ensuring gender equality and skills for the global south. Hello, everyone. I'm Constance de Bula. I am representing Audible. Audible is a 100% Amazon daughter. We are specialized in the production distribution of spoken word contents, namely audiobooks, but also other spoken word formats, such as original productions, coachings, language courses, uh, educational material, lectures, for instance, textbooks. And so what do we do about inclusion? Well, we are a perfectly accessible uh, product. We work via an app. Um, we know that mobile is more present, especially in, in, in difficult um, or in development um, uh, environments than the internet itself on desktop. Uh, so that's a plus. And then uh, we not only serve the demand side, uh, inclusion-wise, we also so create content, and we do this in a very local approach. So we invest heavily into the culture of the respective country. We invite creators to write for us. We engage local actors to um, play for us in their local language. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great product. <laughs> Hi, morning. My name is Vanessa. I'm from South Africa, from um, Triggerfish Animation. I do have a couple of slides just to give you an idea of who we are. Um, uh, just to, thank you. Just a couple of slides. Um, we're an independent animation studio, um, and we primarily focused on creating our own animation content from the uh, from Africa with stories from African creators. Um, we have very successfully created feature films and TV specials and TV series. Um, our feature films, um, Adventures in Zambezia, and um, ah. Thank you. <laughs> I just thought it'd be nice to show you a visual. Adventures in Zambezia um, was our very first film, um, which traveled in, uh, to over 150 countries, was dubbed in over 27 languages, um, alongside our next film, Kumba. And these two films are still uh, the top five African films ever created and um, distributed worldwide in the cinematic 
business model. Um, this is not only for animation, but for films from Africa. Um, we also have created a, a couple of TV specials for the BBC. Um, Revolting Rhymes was Oscar nominated two years ago. And, and, and what these films really do is allow us to skills build and develop um, talent on the continent, and specifically in South Africa, we've been very privileged to do this. Um, these are some more of our, our films at the moment, and this is a, a short film. We, If you're with us till the very end of this session, you'll get a, the pleasure of watching, um, and the, uh, more of our Christmas specials. <coughs> what I'd love to talk about is, um, in this session, is more about our, our content, our new content that's being created to serve African stories more authentically than ever before and to bridge gaps um, and, and making sure that diverse cultures are represented. And so we very actively evolve in producing animation, but because the industry in Africa is, um, is very organic and fluid, we not only can produce, but we also are want, needing to stimulate um, skills development gaps. So that means masterclasses, incubators, um, training sessions to help once we've identified gaps in the industry from students all the way through to, to professional level. Um, we have an academy which has free online materials because we really see that obviously the, the key is to be online, but if you are online and you're interested in animation anywhere in the world, but for the continent, we're wanting to make sure that um, there's access and that you're able to study animation um, and that it is something that you you'll be able to see if this is a career for you. Um, we have many conversations online, African women in animation, conversations to stimulate women and to support them in producing content and, and so much more. Um, scholarships, educational um, bridging courses to make sure that the industry is growing. And so it's not only about um, producing, but it's about making sure the industry is growing and that we are um, serving skills development. That's me in a nutshell. Well, thank you, everyone. As you can tell, we have a very excellent panel of experts. Um, just a quick note for everyone in the back. Can you please just move up to the table? We'd love to have a more intimate conversation with you all, especially because this room is massive. <laughs> um, OK, so moving along to the first question. As we learned earlier this week at the high level panel on inclusion, all connectivity is not the same. And in, in order to ensure connectivity and to ensure that people want to go online, we need to have meaningful connectivity. We need to close the digital gap. And to help do this, the World Wide Web Foundation actually has a framework that discusses how we can dis close this digital gap. And the framework is called REACT. REACT stands for Rights, Education, access, content, and targets. To our panelists, can you please give an example of a time that your organization or your work has supported an aspect of this framework? Um, thank you for introducing this. Uh, I think it's rather relevant. I do come from the youth programs uh, from these institutions. I do come from a next-gen program from in, within ICANN. And what I always complained was that these programs leave the youth just hanging, sort of. They get this experience, they get in touch with this environment, but then there's no continuity. So it feels a little bit, it's very valuable, but then what's the next step? So what I've been doing for the past few years, whenever we have a project, um, what I do is I try to grab from this pool of youth incorporate them into real projects so that they don't only get qualified in international policy making in this way, but they actually get to participate <laughs> in the process, earn money doing it, and start growing within the environment in a meaningful way. And I feel like this is something that moving forward, everybody coming from these youth programs should be aiming for. How do we make good use with our own resources? So this is my personal take on how to address this sort of objective. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I love this idea of meaningful connectivity. I'd like to uh, focus on, on three of the uh, acronyms in uh, REACT, uh, rights, education, and content. So as it concerns rights, uh, UNESCO in 2015, our 193 member states adopted what we call the Internet Universality Framework, which guides our work more broadly on digital transformation and digital inclusion. What is this framework concretely? We have another acronym because it's in the United Nations uh, and in the NGO world we love acronyms and our acronym is called Rome and and the idea is that anything related to uh, access and literacy on the internet should be based first of all on rights 
should be, secondly, based on openness, the O, should be based on accessibility, and should also be based on multi-stakeholderism. And this really guides a lot of the work that we're doing in digital inclusion, specifically in what we call it UNESCO Media and Information Literacy and Digital Literacy. As it concerns education and, and talking uh, briefly about digital literacy specifically, uh, and one of the reasons why I love this uh, concept of meaningful connectivity is that it isn't just about access and infrastructure, it's also about the production of local content. And uh, UNESCO, in the framework of our work uh, in facilitating the WISIS follow-up action line dedicated uh, to multilingualism, cultural diversity, and local content online really puts the emphasis on the need to ensure not only access, but that people, and particularly young people in the global south, are equipped with the necessary tools not only to be consumers of digital content, but also producers of locally relevant digital content. Just uh, very briefly to highlight specifically our, our work as it concerns including women and girls in uh, digital inclusion and digital literacy and education initiatives, we recently published a document online and I highly recommend uh, for those interested in learning more to download it. All of our work is published open access uh, online called I'd Blush If I Could, Closing Gender Digital Divides in Digital Skills Through Education. And this was done in the framework of our Equals Partnership, also uh, with the support of the German uh, government. And this publication looks specifically at recommendations to bridge this troubling divide and what information is needed in order to uh, ensure advocacy of why it's so important to ensure gender equality and digital skills development in professional teams also actually building the technology, looking specifically at embedded bias in digital literacy tools, which is something that's often overlooked, especially in the field of AI. I'd like uh, really quickly to talk about statistics, just to give you an idea of why this is so important as it concerns our focus in, in this specific area of education. Uh, we, uh, in our research, have uh, underlined what we call the ICT gender equality paradox. In countries with the highest levels of gender equality, such as those in Europe, uh, they also have the lowest proportions of women pursuing advanced degrees in computer science and related subjects. Conversely, countries with low levels of gender equality, such as those in the Arab region, have the highest proportions of women completing advanced technology degrees. What does that mean concretely? Belgium, for example, only has 6% of ICT graduates who are women, while the UAE, it's 58%. So there's a need here, it's, it's shocking this paradox, there's a need here uh, to encourage measurements that ensure that we have the right tools, and this speaks also indirectly to your question on the T, the targets, uh, to advocate for women's inclusion in digital skills education in all countries. This is not a developing country problem. This is an issue that needs to be addressed at the global level. And there's also an opportunity, and I have great respect for your work, because there's also an opportunity to change the narrative through initiatives like yours about how we think about models that are coming out, in fact, of the global south, of countries, for example, like Senegal, that has uh, taken enormous measures to ensure the integration of ICT education programs in formal, non-formal, and informal sectors to uh, make sure that women are producers and have the skills necessary necessary to actively participate in this field. I'd like, uh, lastly, just to underline the aspect of content uh, in uh, underlining one of our initiatives and also inviting you all to participate in this initiative. It's an initiative that we just launched called the Futures of Education Initiative, Learning to Become. And this initiative looks at sparking conversations on how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. And from December 2019, so in a couple days, to the summer of 2020, we will be in a listening phase of this project, which looks at uh, how to ensure multi-stakeholder consultation and contributions from otherwise marginalized groups and civil societies uh, to ensure that these opinions are integrated into this Futures of Education initiative. And Concretely, what this means is that we are looking for input from uh, different stakeholder groups to rethink the way in which we develop public policies related to promoting local content and digital inclusion online. And this uh, leads also to the fact that uh, the UN at large uh, is currently rethinking the way in which we develop public policy on issues like digital inclusion, that it's not a top-down approach, that it's a crowdsourced, inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach for developments of public policies based on needs identified 
on the ground, specifically in the global south, on issues related to digital inclusion and how this digital inclusion and ensuring digital inclusion changes how we can leapfrog to meeting the sustainable development goals. Thank you, that was wonderful. I just want to add that I love that you mentioned that girls don't enter STEM fields equally throughout countries. And one of the things that UNICEF found in a study was that at a very young age, girls actually want to enter STEM fields at the same rate as boys, but sometime around puberty, they lose the confidence to do so and drop out of going into those fields. So Vanessa's work and just having content is so important because if girls can see themselves represented in the media in these STEM fields, then they can actually believe that they can achieve it and will go into it. So just representation is so, so important for getting girls into STEM. I just was asking Vanessa if she wants to continue because she's finished, but I can, I can go first. So um, the audible engagement with respect to re reduction of access barriers is always very local because it is local. We engage in the countries where we operate in. It's currently 10 countries. And I start actually with a flagship country, which is the U.S., so um, in 2007, when Audible did not yet belong to Amazon, we moved our headquarter out of New York to Newark, New Jersey, which is basically at the other side of the Hudson River and which is a socially very challenging area. Lots of murders, to say the uh, a very complicated, uh, not much money, underemployment, uh, lots of clochards on the street. So it was a very difficult area. But our CEO, Don Katz, strongly believed in the potential of the area and said, if we as an employer go there and start to invest, start to create employment, the city will live up. And that's actually what has happened. So I have, I have been living, I've been working for Audible now for nine years. And over those nine years, even Starbucks has moved back into the area now. I mean, this is kind of the checkpoint. Um, so, but I didn't want to talk about this. I just wanted to talk about a project that we call Listen Up, and it is dedicated to Newark young high school sc students. So those those young uh, young people normally don't have access to culture, just lacking the financial uh, the financial need uh, uh, um, tools. And what um, what we decided as a company is, okay, they don't get it. We are here. We are part of that culture. We want to give them access to culture. And so what we are funding is, so far we funded 15,000 free Audible memberships for young high school students in Newark. Uh, we give them an Amazon tablet so that they have also uh, the device to listen to audio books and other, um, other spoken word contents. And we have put together, with the help of uh, teachers, a list of more than 100 educational books that once again like reduces the access to education and culture for them. And it's a great project, as you can imagine. So uh, young people take the offer, they listen to, uh, to stuff. It's put at their disposal, like there is no barrier, basically. And, and that's a huge, uh, huge success. Um, a second initiative, also very local, but in a completely different environment and also uh, um, more a governmental initiative is the Pass Culture in France. So um, I'm not sure you've heard about it, but Emmanuel Macron already in his electoral program had announced that he wanted to give young people who turn 18 access to cultural goods because that's kind of the tipping point where they decide either to stay culturally open and to consume cultural goods or not. And so they have put together, they've been working on it for one and a half year now, they've put together an app called Le Pass Culture, the cultural passport, um, that gives young people free access uh, for like, I, I guess you get a voucher of 500 euros and you can spend it on cultural goods. Go to the theater, uh, consume books, subscribe to these, uh, um, whatever culture is actually. It's a very broad uh, definition. And so Audible is co-sponsoring this. So we give a list of free audiobooks uh, and it's taken up and it's very interesting also what those 18 year old um, uh, listen to because they listen to inspirational contents. So amongst other, there's also uh, high literature, but Amongst other, uh, there is, for instance, the biography of Antoine Griezmann. I don't know, but it's one of the world's best soccer players. And I think that's a symptom of what they are looking for, inspiration role models. And uh, we are very happy and proud to participate in this initiative and to be part um, of that discovery story. 
in a way that ties into my earlier point about having that inspiration to aspire to whatever field you want to go into. So having that resource out there and seeing how Antoine Griezmann got to where he is can really change kids' lives. Um, and that's so exciting to hear all these initiatives on the panel because that's so important. And and obviously these kinds of sessions are for policymakers and for and for those of us who are actually changing and have the the ability to be able to uh, invest into these things. And and these are all ideas and handles. And I really hope that anyone watching this or in this session, you know, will be able to walk away with handles and ideas of what to try in areas relating to concerns or challenges in their areas. Um, because this is what it is, it's about sharing all these great initiatives. Um, I wanted also just go to quickly to a statistic about women in creative um, industry and specifically in film. What we've noticed, and this is a worldwide statistic, that um, over 60% of students who are actually going into um, tertiary education in creative film uh, are women. Um, and when it comes to workplace, less than 20% um, are women. And so there's this huge disparity between the confidence to go study and then it seemingly feels like a lack of confidence to apply for that job. Whether it is portfolio, whether it is um, technical skills and abilities, there just seems to be this huge gap. And so on, on the African um, continent, we look at this as something where it, for us, is certainly something we need to work on and is something we're um, supporting alongside just uh, different cultures being represented as well. So there's, um, there's clearly an issue here and it's not just for emerging, emerging countries. Um, I do have a couple of slides just um, for the multimedia team. Thank you. Um, we were just talking about how how to respond to um, to react and and how to look at how to and what that means in our context um, a very big thing for us as I mentioned earlier was just access for all and and being able to provide animation training and an opportunity to see if this career in animation is something of interest to young people in high school. We also have something that's quite fun is called a parent persuasion kit. What we found specifically in black cultures, you know, there is this thing I was laughing online, a joke yesterday where, um, amongst some female writers where it says your dad said on an airplane, um, I'm really bad at telling jokes, sorry. On an airplane, a dad and a daughter are sitting and the dad is, um, they're looking for, there's a medical emergency and the dad says, you see, they didn't need a graphic designer. We're like, you should have been a doctor. And the daughter's like, dad, this is a medical emergency. And he's like, well, maybe you should create a designer, um, a brochure for that, you know? And it's just like this thing of, uh, that specifically in black culture where it, creative industries is not something that parents will encourage their young people to move into um, for many reasons. And so we're, what we're trying to do is also chat to parents and say actually uh, a career in the creative arts and in film is something as aspirational and that there is work bottom line there is actually work and a healthy industry is when you're ticking boxes in all those areas from growth from skills development all the way through to an actual industry that is growing um, access to all conversations for all um, those are really important things. Education for talent, and I've mentioned how, just in terms of initiatives, we're needing to make sure that, that you know, education is expensive, especially in filmmaking and in animation. It's very technology-based. It's um, a lot of uh, <coughs> software coding, programming skills are needed, and there seems to be a great divide between um, the talent and then an opportunity to study. So we really are looking for lots more support in this area, but. Um, with regards to skills development, we, as a, as a team at Triggerfish, um, not only just trying to keep the lights on as a production company and creating content, we want to actually bridge those gaps. Um, gaps where we've identified, you know, creators are not able to, don't feel confident yet to be able to pitch their projects internationally um, at markets, um, therefore not able to actually have those meetings, therefore possibly not being developed or, or funded um, by partners because they actually haven't taken that step. And so it's an, it's an area where we mentor and encourage young creators to to get pitch ready and to get to market. So those are all funding steps. And, and then to, in that space, we're quite confident that their story if um, after a bit of research identified for this broadcaster or this partner is something that is certainly interest, interesting to that broadcaster and to the world. And just that confidence to be in that space I've seen in the last um, four years since la launching the Story Lab with the Disney company, um, we've seen so much seed come to life. And just a little recap, um, the Story Lab, sorry, I... Uh, <laughs> ah. 
So the Story Lab, I'll go back to those slides in a sec. The Story Lab was an initiative we launched in 2015. We simply did commercials and online advertising and said to the continent, <laughs> if you have a story for film or TV um, with the support of the Walt Disney Company and Triggerfish, we would love to hear from you. And 1,400 submissions were received, which is very, very high. Um, I was expecting maybe 250, and when the numbers kept going up and up and up, we were kind of all gobsmacked. 1,400 stories and ideas were brought forward. We were then able to bring it down to a um, 35 projects that were then brought to, to Cape Town for two weeks of masterclass and training, pitch readiness, um, getting those projects, those ideas tested, because when you have an idea and you're presenting it to international partners, it has to be pitch ready and you have to have plugged out and ironed out all those story gaps and you have concept art, this is animation, you need to have um, something that will wow people. And what we did from that point is we chose eight filmmakers with feature film ideas as well as four TV series creators. And what an amazing success since then and I've watched those 35 um, creators got on to do some amazing things. And that's just an example of enabling. I've recently run a writer's lab in the same vein where we, we um, reached out to the continent and asked female writers, especially women of color, to submit their writing samples. And we received 750 submissions to which we were able to select 12 to go to Lusaka, Zambia for a, for a big writing masterclass in writing for animation. And really what we see is women needing an opportunity to go from I write, I'm talented, I'm gifted, I write currently for my local telenovela or soapies market, but I really would like to move into animation. Let's, give the, let's enable them and give them those steps um, into the, let's ha give them access to the broadcaster experts um, internationally so that they can feel confident to pitch their ideas and scripts. And what we have at the moment um, on a TV series I currently am producing, we have eight women from the continent, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, Kenya, and one South African who are the voice of an authentic new series that is being that is currently in pre-production. And how exciting to see these women write for audiences who previously have never had animation um, created for them. Um, 14 black girls are our heroes set in Lusaka and they need to not only face high school and, and all that that brings, those challenges, but also save the world on a budget. Um, African ingenuity is something we really treasure and African people are very tenacious. If we don't have resources, we're going to make it work. You know, we're not, we, we don't say no. And, um, and so it's this wonderful, it is a comedy and it really is going to be fun and action packed and, and show a good, these girls engineering and programming their own gadgets and taking on these really big villains with lots of money and, and huge corporations. Um, I digress. Um, some of the other areas as well that, that I personally have been involved in, and, and as I mentioned earlier, is we simply can't just be a creators of content that would simply be short-sighted. And so we, we have to have conversations. We have to speak to creators on the continent to make sure that they they're from writing through to artistry, through to technicians, through to um, the entire team that pulls off an animation project, that they have access and to be able to apply, to be able to work, to be able to have some skills development. We actively bring international experts to, to South Africa, to our studio, um, to have that skills transfer. And this is just an example of African women in animation and 400 members who are currently, uh, just under 400, who are chatting online um, about what it's like to be pitching projects as a woman on the continent in the animation space. And we do a huge amount of high school training from just drawing through to story development and idea development. And um, our online courses are, are very much there to support the, the entire conversation. And all of this really results in a healthy industry and business will grow naturally from the space where there's confident creators. And um, that's just a little example of the holistic view we have of the continent from Triggerfish. Thank you. I think we heard a wide <coughs> range of how people are being educated in terms of digital skills, in terms of how to offer mentorship and how to be mentored, and in terms of how to develop a way to ensure that people are going online and finding content that they need. So I think this is a great segue into my next question, which is let's dis discuss the supply and demand side of technologies. We know that having infrastructure is important for technologies, that having access is important, but people need a reason to want to go online and need an incentive to do so. So I would love to know about, I know we've touched on this briefly, but maybe in more detail, about how you have helped 
develop or disseminate locally relevant content, or how your organizations have um, basically helped develop the demand side of internet deployment, not only the supply side. You can go in any order, whoever <laughs> wants to be first. Thank you for the question. So whenever um, we're looking into how to help policymakers and content makers further something in Latin America or in the global south uh, as a whole, our concern is always the medium. Because this is very important. The, the medium won't be the same in, the, in, in a different context when you're falling out of this um, market in which you're thinking about high definition and what's the latest that Apple has released. When you're looking towards the developing world, it's always about mobile phones. That's where the market really is right now. This is where the focus is. And I have some statistics here that say children in particular, and here we're talking 12 or, or, and under, 50% of them are accessing this content through mobile phones, up from 20% in 2012. So this is a big increase in a very short amount of time, and it shows a trend. It shows that this is a very accessible thing. This is something that they can relate to. It's quick. It's something that makes sense for them. But the problem is, not the problem, the situation is that these phones are not high-end phones. We're not talking about ultra definition. We're talking about very cheap phones. <laughs> We're talking about simple phones. And when you're thinking about producing at a very high scale, you know, you're thinking for displays of 72 inches displays, a lot of the content coming from the global north, which is where a lot of the content originates from, is aimed at very large displays. No, the content that needs to be produced locally needs to take very much into account the fact that this will be displayed in low resolution screens and potentially if it's something that's being taken from another country, it will a, need to be subtitled, and the subtitles will take a lot of screen real estate as well, <laughs> making the content need to be even more focused, or they will need to be dubbed and provided in a local language. So it's a consideration that I think is systemic. When, you, when you're trying to bring your content, it's just not a, a matter of taking a series that's popular somewhere and just, you know, here you go. There's a lot of consideration for how that media will show within what is available within the region. And this is the sort of advice that we try to give when people approach us from this angle, how to do something that's meaningful. And the trend so far, um, at least from Brazil, is that kids are not only going for the funny content, which to me is very exciting. People who are managing to have a lot of success in the market is the people who understand these constraints and work with, with a language that's engaging and entertaining and just baking just enough educational content there to get them interested. It's, I, I, I like to think of it as a new way of bringing education and entertainment together. It's not just the format that we're used to from this imported content that we get from the global north. The global south, especially in Latin America, things are very you know, light, they need to be fun, they need to be situational. It's just the way the culture works and people who are starting to tap into that and understand how the culture works, how the limitations work, and make products that feel like they are made, made for the region, so it's local producers, a lot of them, and some people from the outside who are understanding. So whenever I think about this question, I think, what is the number one priority? To remember that Latin America, for example, it might not be as linguistically diverse as some other sectors of the developing world, but it's still very diverse. Yeah. Portuguese and Spanish do share a lot of space with French, English, we're looking at, at, at something, in, and many companies often just go for, okay, I'll just go for Brazil. Brazil is very lucrative. Or I'll go for Spanish, because it affects a lot of countries. When in fact, what we have been observing, I think, when you manage to do something that thinks of all, every aspect, all the way from the Caribbean down, and you are sensitive to those, the, the, those little 
qualities, you end up having something like a, a hit. You have something that people really are interested in and really talking about. And you can see that when you, we come to, especially to these spaces, when there's youth groups who are talking about something, a lot of things they talk about may be very local. They're talking about the thing that's in their country. But a few things, they just transcend the region and everybody gets to talk about them. So that's the sort of thing we should be aiming for, right? Things that can impact not only a very specific region, something that can make sense for everyone. So this is the standpoint I always come from when people ask me, hey, how to make a big impact in Latin America? I think there is a way, but it needs to be really fought off. It's just not importing content and pasting a subtitle there, and there you go. There's a little bit of more of a tough process behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Constance, I would love to segue into you because I know that Audible has to think a lot about how to make the content very local, and that's something that Mark touched upon. So how does Audible basically make the content into different languages and ensure that it's authentic and relevant to the communities it goes into? Sure, yeah, I can only support what, uh, what Mark just uh, explained and developed, that to really have a relevant content catalog for local people, for French, for Brazilians, for Africans, you need to speak their language, not only speak their language by, uh, by supporting subtitles, but really uh, address the topics in their language. And so what we do is, uh, when we open up a new store in a new country, so recently, for instance, India, we will produce Hindi content and we will search for local authors and local writers to write that content. We will work with local publishers to get their books into audio in local language and we will also of course engage um, uh, local actors to play or to speak or to narrate um, those contents. That's, that's the key element otherwise just like putting still more English content, and I have nothing against English content, it's great. But however, there is still so much subculture and relevant local culture and relevant country culture. If you do not serve this, people will just not accept your offer. And the best example is actually France, so I'm responsible for France, so they just refuse it. I love that. Uh, so basically what we had to do is we started with a very big catalog of 2,000 books um, three years back. And um, of course, the first thing we did was translate the big English author, name them Stephen King, um, for instance, into a local language and publish them. But the business really took up from the very moment when we engaged massively with local French authors, Guillaume Musso, uh, for instance, and published their content <laughs> and distributed their content. Um, that made the difference. And now we even push this further. Um, so uh, not only uh, we publish those contents that we sub-license from publishers, but we also create relevant local content. So we are searching for writers who write original productions for us, who raise relevant topics. For instance, we just launched a series about uh, urban 30-somethings, um, which, uh, which was a decent success. Um, and then we address also locally relevant topics. Um, one other thing that I would like to highlight is, and I'm piggybacking a little bit on what you said earlier, is those local content creation goes along with the creation of a local ecosystem that is very healthy. So um, again, I quote the example of France. We've been investing 10 million euro over the last two and a half years into content creation. Is 10 million euros go to writers, but they go namely to actors who actually by also engaging in spoken word cre uh, creation, um, find a new source of revenue and to, to gain their life. Uh, we've been working with 250 uh, uh, French actors so far. For them, it's an opportunity. And for us, it makes sure that we create uh, linguistically uh, beautiful content uh, for, for that audience. Sasha. Thank you very much. As, as UNESCO, I'm absolutely thrilled that this is uh, the conversation is turning around questions of, of culture, which is the heart of a lot of our work. I, I'd just like to reflect on what you said earlier, saying uh, going online and finding content that they need. And uh, I, I know a lot of the speakers have also underlined, you know, not only finding the content that they need, but above all, having the skills that if the content that they're looking for is not there, that they have the skills both as it concerns content production, but also, and, and here it's absolutely crucial for us, and I'll, I'll talk in a moment about one of our experiences that highlight this, um, they have the business skills 
necessary in order to scale it because there are lots of great ideas that don't take off uh, on the ground because they're lacking either a, a team or the necessary management skills in order to monetize, uh, commercialize, and scale it, uh, particularly, again, uh, in the global south. Here I'd like to underline uh, one of our, and highlight one of our projects uh, called the Women in African History Project uh, that really uh, highlights a lot of the questions that are uh, being addressed uh, specifically with regards to this um, uh, emphasis on how can we drive demand, is that in um, the African continent, there was a decision that was adopted that um, ed African history would be taught in schools. But then the question is, okay, well, what African history, and UNESCO worked on, uh, from uh, the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, um, textbooks related to the history of the continent, but these textbooks are 300 pages long. They will be used, obviously, by PhD students and by historians, but not necessarily in elementary school. So here it touches also on the question of multilingualism and, and language, not only as it concerns the spoken language, but the form in which this content is taking. And so UNESCO uh, developed an online tool using hip hop and slam and digital comic strips, developed by uh, actually local African artists uh, across the continent to talk about African history, but specifically the contribution of women to the history of Africa and to African development. Because we noticed that in a lot of the, these narratives, the presence of women is completely absent. And so this is also rectifying prejudices that are embedded in the production of local content, uh, specifically as it concerns this subject um, uh, particularly. I'd like also uh, very briefly before talking a little bit about the concrete statistics that show why investing in local content uh, directly contributes to economic growth and the need for uh, a call to increased infrastructure. Um, think about what you were saying as it concerns trigger fish and how you underlined what we most need is creativity uh, because that is something that we promote very much in our work on digital inclusion is that creativity is an essential part of how we develop digital inclusion programs. Uh, you do not need to be a programmer and an engineer in order to work in the field of digital inclusion. And actually what we're seeing in a lot of our research is that what's most needed is the capacity uh, to teach specifically young people and, and women here particularly um, why a creative thinking and systems thinking can be an essential uh, tool and asset in the way in which we think about developing digital inclusion programs. Uh, just the other day there was an article that was published that I found really interesting that was an uh, argument advocating for the need for Google, for example, to hire philosophers, saying we don't, we don't need any more engineers. What we need is philosophers that can think uh, on a philosophical level, obviously, but also on a sociological level. What are the programs, for example, using AI, that can be developed that would be uh, directly locally relevant and contribute in a sustainable way to digital inclusion? Uh, very briefly to highlight some of the, again, statistics and research coming out of UNESCO and our partners. Uh, that uh, underline the need to drive local content production for economic development. Today, women and girls are 25% less likely than men to know how to leverage digital technology for basic purposes, four times less likely to know how to program computers, and 13 times less likely to file for technology patents. So here it underlines the need again to invest in business skills while accompanying this kind of creative local content production. It's shown, and Vodafone Sustainable Business Report has, has underlined this, that measures designed to enable women and girls to thrive, particularly in the digital sphere, potentially increase GDP in certain countries by up to 34%. And this is absolutely uh, essential and it really underlines the link between education, local content, infrastructure and access, and economic growth. And here I'd like to very briefly touch on one of our programs that we're doing that uh, has a comprehensive approach to how we look at uh, connecting economic growth, digital inclusion, and infrastructure. I know that you uh, mentioned a little bit earlier that a lot of the access uh, to the internet, particularly in developing countries, is uh, coming through mobile phones. I lived for a very long time in Senegal where there are more SIM cards in circulation 
than there are people in the country. <laughs> and the reason why this is, is that, you know, Orange or, or other companies will have promotions on access, and so they'll switch their SIM card, and they'll use the discount code, and they'll have a privileged access to, and discounted access to the internet, because access is incredibly expensive. In a lot of the countries uh, that most need this access in order to produce local solutions for digital inclusion and economic growth, 93% of people in Senegal access the internet through their mobile phones. So the way in which we think about mobile solutions to promote digital inclusion and economic growth is absolutely crucial. And in this vein, UNESCO developed a program that we called the Youth Mobile Initiative. And the Youth Mobile Initiative looks specifically at how uh, to empower young people, and particularly young women, with the possibility to develop mobile applications that solve local solutions, local problems that contribute to sustainable development. And I see someone from the Senegalese government in the room and would just like to recognize the incredible partnership uh, with Sherif Diallo, uh, who was very much involved in uh, the ministry with whom we worked, uh, that is uh, really uh, setting the example of best practices in West Africa as it concerns public-private sector partnerships that promote this kind of approach. And so in the framework of the Youth Mobile Initiative that we undertook in partnership with the government of Senegal and uh, private sector Orange, we trained young women in order to develop mobile app solutions. And very concretely, we, for example, uh, developed a program uh, that looked at how to circulate uh, textbooks for uh, p young people in school, because in reality, most people can't afford every year to buy new textbooks. And these textbooks are sitting there and just uh, uh, being used uh, to light a fire, because once you're finished with the textbook, there's no circulation. And so there was a mobile app solution developed by a young woman to ensure circulation of these kinds of textbooks. Another mobile app looks at, for example, family planning or access to uh, medical records of your newly born child so you can record it on your mobile app and not on a piece of paper that is either gonna get lost or uh, be destroyed with humidity et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things that we did very closely with the government and the private sector is to say, okay, they have the technical competencies. How do we ensure that they have the business skills? And here, it's again something that has come up on multiple occasions is this uh, need to ensure mentorship programs that bring together the public and private sector, that ensure uh, business scalability and skills for these digital solutions, and that inscribe them in the local innovation and private sector ecosystem so that there are uh, ecosystems that are built that are sustainable, that are local, uh, and that are supported. There is no reason to import internationally solutions that are being made on the ground. The reason why these solutions are often imported from abroad is because there is not the capacity to scale these solutions or to support or uh, incentives to invest in local um, uh, enterprises. And this is something that we're looking at is really the connection between uh, infrastructure, uh, GDP growth, uh, and digital inclusion programs. Thank you. I think what we've heard so far is that you really have to know the market that you're going into, know what problems are trying to be solved, don't import broad solutions that may have worked in other regions but may not necessarily work for that specific country. I didn't introduce myself before, but I'm Sajda from Walt, the Walt Disney Company, and that's something that we're thinking, up, thinking of a lot um, in terms of when we're growing to new markets and going into um, new territories, how do we ensure that the content that we put out is content that is relevant to local stories and is authentic and really comes from the people and considers the people. And with that, I'd like to segue into Vanessa because I know that that's something she's also working on. Thank you, Sadia. Um, what I have seen um, before I just, um, thank you, <laughs> before I just go into what we're currently doing is just looking at the landscape of the last 10 years. So as an African film producer, I have seen um, typical business models that we, you know, we're a studio that creates African stories for release to the world. That's really our model. We, we're not in a place where we're supported by the state to be able to just be creative and create without um, any sort of business model that would sustain that. So we, we're needing to export internationally. And therefore, the, the challenge is to make sure our content speaks to the world, has universal story themes that, um, a New, York and, uh, a New Yorker and, and, and a girl in Ghana and somebody in Israel would be able to connect because it's a story about 
girls, a teenager, high school. And so we're constantly having to create content that is um, uniquely universal, but also specific to, um, to where we come from. So the challenge over the last 10 years is we've had to fit into business models, but what we've been very clear on is that our content from our artists to our writers to our voiceover talent as far as possible outside of marketing um, strategy is uh, our music, our composers, um, all the technical art um, artistry from um, asset creation in 3D programs to um, performance um, in animation to compositing and lighting and all those sort of uh, computer gener generated work um, workflows are all local artists and all African artists and so we have a huge network of artists we work with to make sure that our industry is growing and it's not being left behind and then to help those artists take the next step to world-class high-quality content and then the trick for us is to try and get that sold abroad and to try to recoup some of the investors finance and and so it's tricky out there um, in another session later today at, at um, 3 p.m. I'm going to be talking about what that looks like as a business model and how from the from the African context um, we've had to try and survive in this space but what I've seen in the last two years is such a shift obviously there has been so much more focus on digital in, um, inclusion as well as making sure we represent all diverse cultures as far as possible we've seen films like um, from the Disney company and from Pixar as such as Coco we've seen um, Moana and I know that there's a couple more feature films in the pipeline and, and original content so I'm excited about that and and we've seen a huge shift um, these series I'm currently working on and I'd love to just showcase that um, thank you just on a slide <laughs> Um, is a project called Mama K's Team 4, and it originates from um, from Malenga Mulindema. She's a, a creator from Lusaka, Zambia, and the show itself is, as I mentioned earlier, shows 14 hero, heroes in the lead. I'll quickly skip forward. Um, four hero girls <coughs> in the lead, and, and this image really just represents our audience and the and and a picture and it just reminds us of who we're representing and and why these young girls have never seen themselves on screen when we first met um sorry when we first met Melenga, this was her story that um this was through the disney supported story lab that she never ha she's never seen a superhero story where young girl african girls black girls take the lead um, and she wanted to do that, and this was the reason she pitched her concept. This was her and her sister, and she never saw herself on screen. And this is Malenga, who's currently working with us um, in the writing space at the moment in Cape Town, as we produce the first 20 episodes of the series called Mama K is Team 4. Um, the colors are not so great on the screen, but these are our, our heroes. This is um, artwork from, from a little while ago. We're not able to show the new artwork, but these are our four girls. Beautiful body shapes, hugely different personality types, showing that women in these STEM themes, learning and building gadgets and engineering the, and their own solutions, taking on the villains of the city, um, comes in all shapes and forms of beauty. And, and what we're really trying to make sure about the series is that girls, these young girls, not only from the STEM themes, but they see themselves as, as beautifully represented from hair to body shapes to personality types, and that it is an inspiring series um, for them. Um, just some, some visuals, I know sometimes it's really great to see some visuals. It's a comedy, and it's got a huge points of action where we see them having to take down baddies and, and face. We're obviously trying to keep the boys hooked as well. It's just, we don't really just want a girl's audience around the world. We want to make sure the boys are as excited about the villains as we are. We did a focus group recently in a, about two weeks ago, and we were very chuffed to see how the boys loved our villains. They are so cool and and badass, and um, I'm, I'm glad those are hooks for us, and we've got to make sure in pre-production that we make sure the boys are engaged as as well as representing girls. Um, I spoke a little bit about that, um, and I just wanted to introduce you to the writers um, on this series who've never previously had an opportunity to write in this space. Um, these were workshops and, and sessions we've been having for the last four or five months from Zambia to South Africa. Sorry, that's just so cute. That's us on, <laughs> on top of Table Mountain. 
Yeah, so that, um, that's really it, and I, I wanted to just quickly add as well that um, as, a, as a team, we, you know, animation, we create animation, animation travels, we're so lucky in that way that we, it is so difficult, and I know the expenses that go into creating content like yours where you have to be um, culturally specific, and, and that comes at a huge expense, and not that animation doesn't have to do that, we have to dub all our work into multiple languages. When we release our series um, in, in Africa, it will be in French, in Pidgin English, in Swahili, um, and and obviously English will be fine as well. But we're wanting to make sure that all all African um, languages that as many viewers as possible can watch this as around the world. Um, and so that's so important that our animation travels. On every project we've worked on, we've made sure that it travels well and that audiences can enjoy it around the world. And uh, yeah. So just thinking about um, the different aspects that you all raised, um, which are like inclusion, creativity, but also accessibility, I was thinking about one tool that travels the Western world, and I think there is maybe room to support it in the global south, as you say, which are podcasts. So podcasts, as you know, have like a huge success over the last 10 years. It started in the US, it's now coming to Europe, and has a true wave. And I think what's so beautiful about podcasts, it, it is mobile. It is user-generated content. It, is, it allows us to express yourself, to tell your very intimate, personal stories. And those are also the podcasts that have the huge success. So it can have a political sphere. It can have a cultural sphere. It can talk about sociological problems, all this. And it is also a prerequisite to set up an ecosystem of spoken word audio, meaning some of those podcasters can make a living out of it as soon as they have the respective audience. So even in Western worlds, like again France, for instance, female topics are very discussed. <laughs> Niche topics that no one would tackle are discussed in podcasts. And all you need is a mobile phone uh, and a recording system on it, which is normally preloaded, and then you can basically start to express yourself. Maybe. Uh, earn a living out of it and for us as Audible of course podcast creation is like a talent hub so we observe very closely what's going on we pick the people either sponsor their podcast or even invite them to write something for our premium product that is a paid product so I think I uh, just wanted to call this out podcast is the new tool to, 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 uh, to support cultural inclusion and cultural accessibility I think I'm so glad that you mentioned that because it's a great uh, move into our next question, which is that technology is sometimes seen as a disruptor. But I've, as we've heard that uh, technology can actually lead to freedom of expression, an example of podcasts, that it can lead to skill building and education. So as a final wrap-up question, I would love to learn more about how you believe technology has empowered local communities increased um, individuals' quality of life and really created new opportunities for people who may have not had those opportunities had it not been for technology. Um, now I'll break a little bit from the format. I know we're talking about our businesses, but I'll talk a little bit about myself because this question touches directly, you know, my personal experience. I didn't exactly have the means to learn the skills that I have, but the internet and multimedia were the way that I found to learn them. So I was very interested in technology and I was very interested in languages, but how do I go about learning those, right? They're, that's expensive to learn. So my way was exactly through multimedia and the internet. That's where I learned to code. That's where I learned English. That's where I learned Spanish. That's where I learned all the skills that I have that now make me a professional that can work within this environment. And when I think about how did that go, why was that possible? Well, a lot of it had to do with what content was cheap or made available in a way that made sense for me or that it was maybe expensive but provided me a lot of return. Because with very limited amount of resources to invest, you need to think about the return, where you're going. So how did I learn English, for instance? I took all the books that I had read in Portuguese and I started to listening to the audiobooks in English because I already had a frame of reference. So what would be a good solution for that if, for example, <coughs> my provider of any media would give me the original version and the translated version as a pack-in? Why is that not an option? 
it is in some media. So in films, when you buy a Blu-ray, it comes with different language aspects. When you some some media like that, it should be a thing for books as well. It should be a thing for all sorts of media because it's a learning tool. But content producers often don't think of it that way. They don't go for that angle. Uh, we were talking about localization and how important it is, and it's super important. But it's also important to remember that this is being used as a learning tool by so many people across the world. So isn't it interesting when you're offering something that's been translated to also give access to the original work? You may be planting a seed there for language learning, which in my case is 100% true. I, I can attest to that not only from a thinking perspective. To me, it was the way to learn the languages that I speak internationally. So when looking at this, I will go back to a media that we haven't really talked about, which is games. I'm very passionate about gaming. I think it's a way to engage young people in a unique manner that feels cool and at the same time can be educational. And when thinking about this, Brazil had a rampant piracy problem. Rampant, just you would go in the streets and just buy pirated material off the streets. And for a long time, the way to combat that was to send police forces to disrupt this business, to do federal actions, and just to get a very coercive action against that. But then, that didn't solve anything. That disrupted the market, but didn't really generate any, any meaningful results. Maybe some politicians will say, no, it did, but it didn't. From a policymaker perspective, now as a policymaker, I understand the result of that was maybe a negative, net negative impact. What really helped, looking at it from a policy perspective, was when some content producers for games started looking at this market and saying, we cannot think of our bottom line in dollars and our target for the global north and try to sell this in reais, the local currency. This doesn't make sense for this market. A few privileged people will have access to this, the others will have to pirate. They started thinking, what is a good price? What is sensible to this market considering the average income of a household? And there's a specific platform that does that. I'll give them a shout out, it's Steam. They started doing that and immediately computer gaming piracy, specifically the PC market, started vanishing. And I was a youth on the streets in a not very privileged neighborhood, I could see it literally starting to disappear as people had access to content that was price sensitive and that made sense for them. And that's how you fight piracy. And that's my broader point. Maybe people in the developing world don't like to pirate, and which is a point that I hear very often when discussing with my colleagues from the IP sector. No, there's a tendency, there's no tendency. They don't have access, they don't have money, they don't have how to access it. They have to make tough choices about where to spend that limited amount of money they have. It's a tough choice. And if you price it fairly, if you make it make sense for them, of course they want to consume the thing. Of course they want to invest in that market. But this is a f line of thinking that is still very removed from a lot of content producers. And this is the sort of thing that moving into the 2020s, as more companies start to establish themselves for real and start thinking of local content, this is also a concern. How to price things in a way that they make sense? Because if you're talking about physical goods, yeah, you're worried about maybe, you know, the, the triangulation of selling, they will buy cheap here and then sell on eBay, sure. But for digital, that's not a thing. For digital, they would acquire in that market and work in that market, and you can check in several ways. So I guess my broader messaging as somebody who really learned my life skills using those tools is the pricing has to make sense, and once you can figure that one out, that's how you unlock access, that's how you make things work on the demand and the supply side. So, sorry for my slightly longer intervention, but hopefully it will give food for thought and so on. Thank you. No, that was wonderful. It was, it was uh, basically relating to an earlier point that we have to think of <laughs> local solutions to local problems, which is, which is something that Sasha talked about when she discussed UNESCO's work. So Sasha, if you want to go next. 
I'd just like to say, if you learned English online, I would like the address so I can <laughs> learn Brazilian Portuguese like you speak English, and we'll immediately download that app and, uh, and begin tonight. Uh, I just, uh, in closing, I would like to uh, talk very briefly about our initiative, the UNESCO Pearson Initiative for Literacy, and give some examples of success stories that directly uh, address some of the questions that you've uh, asked. Uh, as many of you know, uh, 758 million adults in the world, including 115 million youth, don't have the basic literacy skills in order to engage in our digitized economies and participate fully in producing solutions uh, that are digital based uh, in our societies. So to address this issue, uh, UNESCO and Pearson, uh, which is an international education company, teamed up to explore new ways to enable low skilled and low literate youth and adults to profit from inclusive digital technologies and strengthen both their literacy and basic skills. The objectives overall of, of this initiative is really to make sure that we offer meaningful services that support the development of digital skills, that we better understand and design solutions for people with low literacy by taking into account their local cultural context, by creating more engaging content and usable interfaces, including through gaming, which I'm a strong believer in, and, uh, and comic strips and animated films, uh, ensuring the implementation environments, in addition to technology and content, support inclusive usage. So this means developing, enabling public policies that support these kinds of public-private partnerships uh, that have at its heart a dedication to digital skills promotion. And then monitor, measure, and improve solutions as uh, the technology ecosystem, but also our world, changes, for example, in light of AI. This is part of a larger project called Project Literacy, and th at the heart Part of it, it's uh, really looking at how to ensure guidelines that create more inclusive, accessible, and usable digital solutions and policies. So this initiative is broken up into three uh, separate sections. The first is to produce a landscape review that looks at digital solutions and livelihoods and people with low skills and low literacy levels in order to understand through gaps analysis and data how to design, develop, and implement more inclusive digital solutions. Because in order to advocate for these kinds of solutions, we need data, we need information, and we need informed public policy development and programming. The second aspect was to produce uh, 14 in-depth case studies uh, that look at innovative approaches and lessons learned of projects that offer inclusion and skills development based on digital solutions. So just to highlight three of them of the 14 that were highlighted, we received over 160 uh, suggestions of these case studies. All of this is obviously is available online, so if you'd like more information, please feel free to download it. But one of the solutions, for example, is a farmer training app looking at mobile training modules for sustainable farming practices in Central America, knowing that agriculture and sustainable agriculture and the issues related to environmental management is really at the heart of many preoccupations at the global level. The second uh, looks at another priority of UNESCO, which is questions of accessibility and disabilities, and it's called HearScreen, which is a smartphone app for early detection of hearing loss administered by community members with low literacy and digital skills around the world. So again, really looking at how mobile skills development and digital inclusion can change the way in which uh, people with disabilities and marginalized communities can participate actively in our world today. And the third is called Hello Hope Merhaba Umut, which is the translation of language learning and essential information for Syrian refugees living in Turkey. So this solution, for example, underlines again uh, two of our priorities. One is looking at uh, displaced peoples and refugees and how to ensure that despite this displacement, they have the digital skills necessary uh, in order to uh, develop local solutions to the challenges that they're facing, but also looks at the question of multilingualism. And again, uh, reflecting on what you were saying at Triggerfish, one of our commitments is making sure that these uh, solutions are available in local languages. So are available in Swahili, are available in Pular, are available in Jola, which are languages that are um, uh, spoken all across the continent, but that unfortunately a lot of the content uh, de facto are exclusionary because if people can access it, great, 
but they need to understand it. So this is another kind of emphasis that, that we place. And the last aspect is really looking at creating a set of guidelines to inform and support digital solution providers and development partners and governments of why concretely investing in digital solutions that develop the skills of low-skilled and low-literate users not only improves the livelihoods of the target beneficiaries, but also overall improves the economy. So this idea that you know doing good uh, and the country doing well are two separate things is not the case, that actually when you invest in the digital literacy of your communities and of your citizens, the overall well-being of the nation, both as it concerns sustainable development, but also on an economic level, improves. Thank you, Constance. Yes, so for the audio revolution that Audible certainly stands for, so the renaissance of oral culture as, uh, as a culture, technology is the tool. So basically, um, as you, if you think back uh, 800 BC, uh, how was literature uh, conveyed? It was conveyed through oral uh, exchange. But this oral exchange was local and in between some people. So now what happens now with the internet first, then secondly with the mobile phone, thirdly now also with cloud <laughs> service accessible on smart speakers such as uh, um, the Echo, um, so Alexa, um, is that it becomes delocalized again and accessible worldwide on a global scale scale. And that's actually what's currently happening. So our prerequisite for the success of our business was the mobile phone. It really took up uh, in the early 2010 uh, when the mobile phone was uh, democratized in all uh, social spheres and in all geos. Um, that was the point when Audible grew disproportionately, uh, and it does until today, uh, because people discover the beauty of spoken word audio, the beauty on the creation and on the consumption side of spoken word consumption um, through their mobile phone and now also through uh, smart speakers. And so I think technology is it. Uh, and as I said earlier, it is not only demand and supply, it is also a whole ecosystem that is created around it. It is a whole system of creativity, of, of self-discovery at the end also. I'm talking about the podcasters of self-expressive um, so I think um, the internet, and uh, in particular the mobile internet, and the devices that, um, that have been launched over the last years makes the whole difference and opens a whole new sphere of exchange of cultural accessibility and inclusion. I really love and appreciate that the conversation has turned a little bit to um, to giving handles to to policymakers and 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 private sector about investment and and how do you do that because it feels like we're, it's such a big topic we're representing all different countries and 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 the amazing works across um, what our companies are doing but I I really love to just in, to focus on the fact that there is this online um, advancement but it needs to be backed up with physical um, investment on the ground as well. So, it, you know, it, I honestly, your question was about it being a disruptor, but it really, you know, couldn't be far um, further from the truth. Um, when I look at what happens online in terms of online materials and tutorials and the way that you've, Mark, have said that you learnt to do what you do and your skills were all, all learnt online, that is so true of Africa. I think there's so many similarities between South, uh, between Africa and, and South America. When I, when I pitched the series, um, for Mama K's Team 4, we had a team that was based in Brazil um, that was so excited about the fact that these themes that were coming through in the TV series for women um, from developing countries was something that they could relate to, and they were excited about the series as well. So I really see that there, there, there are so many similarities, and, and if, if we could focus on making sure that there are the online tutorials that are free to all, access to all, are there, that would be an amazing step forward, and, and for um, young people to recognize that that is available to them. Um, <laughs> It does require in, in uh, emerging markets that you need physical space, um, like hubs and digital innovation labs. And, and often I'll see that in South African context coming from our universities where there are digital labs. Um, the, the Bongo Hive in, in Lusaka um, is also an example of that. And, and those are wonderful spaces and initiatives where young people can come and have access to hardware and software and be online and to be able to upskill. Um, and I think there has to be hand-in-hand -hand 
cohesion here and that we should invest, whether private or, or, or government, invest into these areas because being online in Africa, having a, is a smartphone is a requirement and having access to the internet is another. And those are all two expensive things. And so hand in hand synergy is so important um, from the African perspective. When it comes to being online, those online tutorials are massive. I've learned so much myself with online tutorials and I often speak to animation students about why why pay for such expensive tutorials, I mean ed education, when they're free on online tutorials. Um, and I completely agree, there is so much more value. I wouldn't excuse the one, but I think there is a lot of similarities. And with that sort of African um, tenacity, the, the desire to learn and to create is there. I've met filmmakers who've created their entire CG film from scratch, from concept to sc uh, script, all the way through to final rendering. And I'm like, how did you do it? It was a Mozique, Mozambican creator, and he did it all by himself. Why? Because no one said you couldn't. And that is the, the heart of Africa. Um, that's how we thrive. And so making sure that there's this material so that we are hungry for it, we'll be able to consume it and, and take steps forward. Online mentorship is also massive. There's the animation mentor programs. There's the women in animation mentorship programs as well, specifically for women. That's um, from Burbank um, in Europe and hopefully soon in Africa, thank you. Um, and, and it really is that the platform that allows online mentorship and to make sure that as, a, as um, cultural um, boundaries are f full and that content from different cultures gets an opportunity to be made and invested in and produced. And so that comes with skills development. Um, and I often, as a producer of content, I often work with artists remotely, which is done through various platforms and I wouldn't be able to do that and wouldn't be able to work with artists in Nigeria. I work with a, a huge amount of uh, Nigerian artists. They're, they're an amazing um, group of people who, because they can't afford to make animation, will create digital comics and sell that online because it's a proof of concept. They've created it and they're trying to build, build some sort of revenue model and I love that. And so I really, if I wasn't able to work with them remotely, that there'd be a huge gap. And so those are amazing examples of what's currently happening. Um, and so I really, just as an encouragement and a handle, those are the areas to invest in alongside your digital hubs and your innovation in incubation centers. Um, there are so many, even on the German, um, from the Guta Institute and GIZ in Africa are, are making some huge grounds and making sure there is space and you feel confident and you feel like you can grow as a creator. And that is so important. So it really has to be hand in hand. Um, yeah. Just want to give a quick thank you to our panelists. I think we heard some fantastic examples of how we are bridging digital gaps and really pushing for inclusion. We heard of personal stories about learning to code and learning languages. We heard about the importance of local solutions to local problems. We heard about the power of technology to be a learning tool and a self-expression tool. And we also learned about how we can bridge the digital gap and create demand for the internet by ensuring that there is locally relevant content. Um, to everyone who has stayed, we have a treat for you. As Vanessa mentioned, we have a short video from Triggerfish that just shows about the power of, the, of storytelling and really is just fantastic. I saw it earlier this week and it's Could it's I really do a great. little introduction? Yes, of Thanks, course. Sadia. So this, um, this little short is five minutes. It's called Belly Flop. It was created in our down, downtime at the studio. Making animation is very expensive. We are not a studio that um, we're trying to figure out how to do world-class entertainment and keep the lights on. That in itself is huge and then growing and birthing an industry to make sure it's inclusive in itself is a massive mandate, but we we're managing. Um, this little short was done in downtime when artists had a day here, a day there, a week here. And um, it, Kelly Dillon is a filmmaker who currently has a preschool TV series with Disney Junior um, that's in development. And this was one of her shorts ideas called Belly Flop, and then she is one of the Disney um, Story Lab finalists from 2015. So it's been wonderful to see, see women feel confident in the space, and in the last three or four years, she's taken leaps and bounds and creating her own content um, for international audiences. So what a wonderful case study. Thank you, you can cue the video.
the second time around, I was totally captivated. Uh, so we have a few minutes now for Q&A for our wonderful panelists. So if anyone has any questions. Hello, good morning. My name is Stanley uh, from Ghana and um, I represent Maxim Anxiety Solutions Foundation. Um, my quick question is, um, it still has to do with access. And um, I had a, the panel, you were mentioning, you kept on mentioning um, that uh, you've designed, that, uh, designed some software uh, to be able to distribute uh, textbooks. You, you spoke about that in Senegal also. Um, my question is, um, how do you deal with the local publishers or how do you deal with uh, copyright when it comes to that aspect? Because it's really been one of the things that we've been uh, uh, battling with in Ghana. We, what we are trying to do is to distribute computers to schools and then try to find a, um, a open source content for the students to use locally. Uh, most of the areas do not have internet access, but I, of course around 90 5% of people are using mobile phones, just like you kept on mentioning. But um, how do you deal with that aspect, um, not to flout the laws? Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that question. Uh, as it concerns the mobile app uh, with regards to textbook circulation, just to clarify, it's uh, textbooks that have been uh, bought that otherwise remain unused, but it's a platform for exchange of, of printed uh, uh, textbooks between students from different classes. But actually, as part of this mobile app, and, and this is something that was brought up that I think is absolutely essential, um, uh, as part of this mobile app, we have links to open educational resources. And uh, here I'd like to underline that there's a lot of advancements in the field of OER and also a lot of misconceptions. The first misconception is that uh, open educational resources means that nobody m makes any money. And so, and this is a huge preoccupation actually, uh, uh, particularly uh, from my experience in West Africa. And so there's a lot of advocacy that needs to be done to say just because um, uh, something has been published under, for example, a Creative Commons license or uh, is an open educational resource does not mean that it uh, cannot be commercialized and sustainable. And, and this is something fundamental in the advocacy that needs to be undertaken also through data that needs to be collected, proving that OER does not mean the death, for example, of the publishing industry in West Africa. There's also a, a question here, and, and, and I'd like to underline a great example coming out of, uh, of Eastern Africa, which is uh, the BRIC, uh, which looks at how to combine uh, questions of access uh, as, with regards very concretely to access to the internet and questions of content. And uh, the BRIC is a portable uh, uh, device that allows uh, for remote communities to have access to the internet embedded in the BRIC is rep a repository of open educational resources. So saying, okay, well, just giving access is, is really not enough. That there's a question of also uh, tailoring local content and making this local content, particularly uh, promoting digital skills, uh, available. So uh, there is a way to support the publishing industry in, in Africa while also uh, promoting circulation of existing publishing. For example, you go to a used bookstore, uh, like the Strand Bookstore in New York, uh, uh, it hasn't killed the the publishing industry uh, in the United States. So what could be a similar uh, platform, uh, for example, uh, in West Africa targeting specifically, uh, in this case, uh, educational textbooks? There are vendors along the streets in Dakar, in Accra, in Lagos, uh, in Ouagadougou uh, that are selling uh, literature, but not necessarily uh, selling uh, the textbooks that are relevant uh, to school programs. And so this mobile app provided a solution to that. Uh, just uh, very briefly, in, in, in closing, specifically as it concerns your question, I think that there are three uh, areas that really need to be uh, built up, uh, specifically in the Global South, to argue for uh, the link between um, open access and open educational resources uh, and commercialization. The first is the need uh, for data. The second is the need for skills training, uh, both uh, in the publishing sector, uh, but also as it concerns economic models uh, that ensure sustainability of these kinds of products. And then the, the last is, is using those first two to ensure uh, enabling public policies. And here I'd like to underline that just a couple days ago at UNESCO's general conference, we adopted um, an open educational resource recommendation, which looks specifically at how to uh, backstop and help public policymakers, but also um, uh, people in industries that are affected by OER, notably the publishing sector, uh, in developing programs and uh, policies that enable this kind of open access. Thank you, that's wonderful. Any other questions before we close? We have about three minutes left. Are there any online questions? Okay. All right, well thank you so much to our panelists. I really enjoyed this and got a lot from it and I hope that all of you have as well. All right, thank you, if I can just get a round of applause. Thank you to our wonderful moderator. <laughs> thank you.